Modern F1 powertrains are engineering marvels. With the same displacement as the original Mazda Miata, they can produce a thousand horsepower and redline somewhere around 15,000 RPM. Achieving these insane specs relies on additional tech like turbocharging and hybrid electric motors to supplement their internal combustion engines. But possibly one of the most fascinating features of an F1 engine is what it's missing. See, F1 engines don't have valve springs. Well, they do, but not the traditional springs you'd expect. Thanks to an innovation from Renault that was so good, everyone eventually copied it. F1 engines began to rev faster and make more power than ever before. In this video, we're talking about pneumatic valve springs. We'll cover why they were invented, how they work, and the incredible benefits they offer in racing's most demanding applications. So let's get into it. In order to understand why F1 cars don't use traditional valve springs, we need to make sure you understand what they are first. In a four-stroke piston internal combustion engine, like the one that's probably in your car, unless you drive this or this, there are valves that allow the flow of air and fuel into the engine and exhaust gases out of the engine. When they close, they create a sealed chamber for an air-fuel mixture to be compressed and then combusted, which drives the engine's pistons and spins the crankshaft. Camshafts control the opening and closing of the valves. These are spun by the crankshaft and are connected to it using a timing belt or chain. The most common valve setup looks something like this, where a spinning camshaft opens the valve by compressing the valve spring. As the cam continues to rotate, it gradually releases the compression of the spring, and the valve spring expands back to its initial position, closing the valve. Simple enough. So if it works for everyone else, why isn't a regular spring good enough for F1? The answer lies back in the decade of square cars and neon everything. A time when F1 teams were pushing turbocharged engines to their absolute limit. Despite a long-standing rule limiting turbo engine displacement to half that of their naturally aspirated competitors, engineers did what engineers do and managed to create turbo engines that were repeatedly outperforming their higher displacement rivals. Leading the turbo charge was Renault, who not only introduced the first turbo F1 car, but also realized that other parts of the engine required significant innovation if they were to continue their quest for ungodly amounts of power. With displacement limited to only 1.5 liters, the most obvious way to make power was to rev the ever-living daylights out of the engine. Most F1 teams at the time could manage about 12,000 RPM before valve springs became their engine's weakest link. As it turns out, a simple spring can cause multiple complex problems when you spin an engine faster than you probably should. The first of these issues is that the spring can just straight up break from the repeated stresses and fatigue of being rapidly compressed and released over and over again. Think of the time you were bored out of your mind and bent a paperclip back and forth until it broke. Same idea. Another issue that can happen at high RPMs is that the speed of the camshaft becomes so fast that the valve spring can't keep up anymore and pull the valve closed in time, leaving the valve open for longer than it should be. This is sometimes referred to as valve float. In the best case scenario, your engine runs less efficiently and makes less power. But in what's known as an interference engine, where the path of the piston overlaps with the path of an open valve, the valve not retracting in time can cause those two parts to become one. Too weak of a valve spring can also cause valve bounce, where the valve rapidly bounces open and refuses to stay closed. So what's the big deal? If the spring is too weak, why not just use a stiffer one? Well, some engine builders experimented with that, but quickly found out there's no such thing as free horsepower. Sure, a stiffer spring will close the valve faster, but it also means that the engine has to work harder because the camshaft needs more torque to compress the spring. Once you reach a certain point, the engine actually makes less power because of the additional cost to drive the camshaft. Combine that with the engineering and manufacturing challenge of creating a spring that can withstand such harsh loading, and it was clear F1 valve spring technology was advancing past the point of diminishing return. Which is why Renault had the bright idea of getting rid of it altogether. <laughs> 
From a patent they applied for in 1982, it's clear they were working on ditching pesky valve springs long before their idea finally took to the track in 1986. But how did they just get rid of such a vital engine part? Well, chances are, you might be sitting on the answer. Similar to how compressed gas allows you to lift your office chair, Renault used compressed gas to close their EF15 engine's valves. Powering the legendary Lotus 98T, this absurd engine gave the even more legendary Ayrton Senna over 1200 horsepower under his right foot at 12,500 RPM. And the new tech wasn't just a gimmick, aiding in two wins and eight pole positions that season. Alright, enough with the history lesson. Let's dive into how pneumatic valve springs actually work. Renault's patent has no shortage of diagrams, but they can be a little tricky to look at. So I created a model of a pneumatic valve spring based on a combination of different designs that are out there. Keep in mind, this doesn't represent exactly how Renault's design looks, or any specific manufacturer for that matter, but all of the operating principles are the same. For each valve in the engine, there's a pneumatic cylinder, a piston which can slide up and down in the cylinder, and some seals which keep everything as airtight as possible. The piston is connected to the valve so that they move together, while the cylinder is fixed to the head of the engine. This piece here is a valve guide, just like you'd see in any other engine, and it maintains the alignment of the valve. In order to make the valves work, we need a pressurized gas supply, which we can get in a couple of different ways. The first is by having a compressor on board the car. Most designs don't use this method though, because the compressor has to get power from somewhere, and nobody likes giving up horsepower. Miata drivers, you know the feeling when you turn on your AC. Not to mention the fact that compressors are heavy, and every ounce that can be saved on a race car is free speed. Instead, most designs use a reservoir hidden under the bodywork that stores compressed gas. The reservoir is pressurized before the race to somewhere around 2000 PSI for an F1 engine, but not with air. Typically, nitrogen is used for the same reasons that teams fill their tires with it. Nitrogen's density is far more stable under temperature changes, and it doesn't retain moisture like air. This is especially important when combustion temperatures inside the engine can reach almost half that of the surface of the sun. Next, we need to fill the pneumatic valve springs with that compressed gas, but we don't need all 2000 PSI. That's why there's a pressure regulator feeding the cylinder head that can be set to fill the valve springs with exactly the right amount of pressure, which might be anywhere from around 80 to 150 PSI. This is done through a one-way valve that allows nitrogen to flow into the cylinders but not leak out. Now that the pneumatic valve springs are pressurized, operating them is surprisingly simple. The compressed nitrogen just becomes the spring. As the camshaft rotates and forces the engine valve open, the nitrogen gas below the piston is compressed. Then, as the camshaft releases pressure on the piston, the pressure from the nitrogen gas forces the piston back up, keeping it in contact with the rocker arm and closing the valve. Pretty cool. But does this design actually solve the problems with normal springs we talked about earlier? Well, let's see. There is no more physical spring to break from fatigue, so that problem is solved. What about valve flute? Well, the gas pressure acts like a really stiff spring, keeping the valve in contact with the camshaft or rocker arm. So even at high RPMs, it's no longer an issue. Now you're probably thinking, but if the gas pressure acts like a stiff spring, won't it rob us of horsepower because it's harder to compress? For the most part, no, it won't. One of the coolest things about pneumatic valve springs is that they're progressive, which means their spring rate actually varies depending on how far they get compressed. I'm going to break out a couple of equations and graphs to better explain this, but bear with me. I promise it's really interesting stuff. First, let's go back to a normal spring, which has this equation. A spring like this, with the same distance between its coils, has what's called a spring constant, which is just a number that describes how stiff it is. The higher the spring constant, the stiffer the spring. X is the distance we want to compress or extend the spring, and F is how much force it takes to do that. We know that the spring constant doesn't change, so a graph of the force required to compress the spring looks like this. 
where the required force increases with distance, linearly, in a straight line. Gases are a bit different. Most gases can be described using something called the ideal gas law, which is a little scarier because it has a lot more letters. But don't worry, we don't need half of them. For the purposes of simplifying things, we can say that N, T, and R remain constant and set them equal to 1, which leaves us with this. The pressure of the gas is equal to 1 divided by the volume of the gas. You can relate the volume of the gas to how far we're compressing the spring. The largest volume is when the piston is at the top of the cylinder and the engine valve is closed, while the smallest volume is when the piston is as far down as it can go and the engine valve is fully open. If we graph the pressure and volume, we end up with this. Notice it's a nice curve instead of a straight line, which tells us something really important. The pneumatic spring is soft and easier to compress initially, and becomes exponentially stiffer and more difficult to compress as the cam opens the valve. In the simplest terms possible, it really gives the best of both worlds, a stiff spring when the valve is fully open to eliminate valve float, and a soft spring when the valve is fully closed to make it easier for the camshaft to open it. By now I've hopefully sold you on how cool this is, so it's only fair that we get into some of the drawbacks of a pneumatic valve spring system before one of you tries to put it on your car. The most obvious of these is complexity. Even the smartest NASA engineers would have trouble designing a system that doesn't leak at least a small amount, which is why having an onboard reservoir is so crucial. The reservoir tops off the pneumatic cylinders anytime they drop below their designed operating pressure, which means that you can only run the engine for so long before you run out of nitrogen. This is fine for racing vehicles that only have to go a planned distance, but imagine having to top off your nitrogen tank every time you went to refuel your car. Even if you had an onboard compressor and a constant gas supply, the seals and components themselves wear at a much faster rate than a traditional spring design, and your valves would probably quit working sooner than you'd expect. Just as you can end up losing pressure, you can also have the opposite problem and build up too much pressure. But how is that possible? Gases expand when heated, so under the intense heat of the surrounding engine parts, the pressure of the nitrogen in the cylinders can sometimes rise past what was intended. Oil or other contaminants can also get into the cylinders and cause a pressure increase, which is why pneumatic valve springs have a pressure release valve. This is usually controlled by compressing a small spring inside the release valve, and the excess pressure vents out to the atmosphere. Even though the additional complexities of the system aren't practical for most engines, the incredible benefits offered by pneumatic valve spring systems have solidified them as the standard across the entire F1 grid and also a lot of MotoGP bikes. So the next time you watch these epic vehicles in action, you can thank Renault for pushing the boundaries of valve train tech and thinking outside the spring. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out this one next, covering all of the fascinating stuff going on inside of pit stop tools. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll catch you next time.